In this video, I've got a very simple question for you. Have you got what it takes to be an entrepreneur? Now, lots of people think that being an entrepreneur is a piece of cake. All you've got to do is just sit there and come up with some idea and just wait for the money to start flowing in. But in reality, being an entrepreneur is very difficult and not everybody is cut out for the entrepreneurial lifestyle. So ask yourself these questions. First of all, do you like to make your own decisions? Or do you prefer to follow instructions and have somebody else make the decisions for you? Now, entrepreneurs are decision makers. In fact, being an entrepreneur is all about making decisions. And entrepreneurs are happy to make decisions and then live by the results, right or wrong. They're quite happy to take the responsibility. They're quite happy to decide exactly what direction their business is going to take. And then they are prepared to follow it through, as I said, right or wrong. So... In order to be an entrepreneur, you really have to be comfortable making decisions. Secondly, are you risk averse? Or are you happy to take a risk if the odds are in your favor? Well, entrepreneurs are risk takers. And being an entrepreneur really is all about taking a risk. You're risking your time. You're risking your capital. Uh, you're risking your business all the time. Now, entrepreneurs, of course, are not rash. They weigh up the risk versus reward. And if the reward outweighs the risk, they're quite prepared to take a risk and to live by the consequences. That said, of course, most entrepreneurs are not rash. They're not stupid. They know when to take a risk, but they also know when to play it safe. Are you curious by nature? Or do you prefer to mind your own business? Well, entrepreneurs are curious. They look at things around them. They inquire. They look for opportunities. And quite often, it's through being curious, it's through being nosy, if you want to put it that way, that many entrepreneurs come up with their best ideas for businesses or to find solutions to problems that people have. So they tend to look at the world in a slightly different way from other people who tend to sort of have a rather narrow focus. And do you give up easily? Or are you someone who perseveres until the end? Well, perseverance is a key entrepreneurial trait and you need to persevere and to overcome all sorts of adversity, all sorts of hardships, all sorts of setbacks. Now, they're not always rather unpleasant physical setbacks like this poor soldier is taking during his boot camp training. But and while you might not have to wade through freezing cold, dirty water under barbed wire with ammunition being fired at you, you will often have to take lots of decisions under stress, under pressure. You'll find that there are lots of setbacks. You'll find that things don't go right for you the first time round. You have to think of different solutions. You have to make different decisions and you have to keep on and you have to keep at it and you have to overcome the adversity. And that is a key trait of being an entrepreneur. And is your glass half empty? Or is it half full? Well, being an optimist is essential if you're an entrepreneur, because as I was just saying, you're going to have to overcome all sorts of adversity. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in what you're doing. You have to believe that you are going to be successful. You have to take a positive outlook with everything that you do. Now, I'm not saying that you should look at the world through rose-colored glasses like this lady. You do have to be realistic and sometimes you have to make the decision that things are not going to work out and you might have to shut your business down. You might have to uh, cancel a project. You might have to decide, well, things really aren't working. But you have to start off after weighing up the risk and reward, after looking at all the balances of probabilities that uh, you are going to be successful and you have to carry on in that vein. So if you can tick all of those boxes, then yes, you probably do have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. 
And if you don't, and being an entrepreneur isn't for you, well, that's fine too. Because let's face it, if everybody worked for themselves, if everybody was an independent person, if everybody ran their own small businesses, then there would be no economy. There would be no jobs.、Uh, there would be no manufacturing. You, know, you, not everybody has what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And frankly, maybe that's a good thing. So, if you've answered yes, then congratulations. You probably do have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. It may surprise you, but anything—and I do mean literally anything—can be made into a business. And I'm going to talk about that in this video. Now, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to either be the best. Or be the first at whatever it is that you're going to do. Being first to offer some sort of product or service, of course, depends on your ability to spot the needs or wants for those goods or services. So you need to take a good look around you. You need to be in touch with what's going on, and you need to be able to spot the opportunities. And that means never giving up on thinking that anything. Can be made into a business. Well, there's a want or a need to be filled. There's a business opportunity, and this can be in anything. It can be in something that you've discovered in your working life. It can be in a hobby. It can be in a pastime. It can be something that you've seen when you've been out and about. It can be something that you've read in the newspaper or magazine or seen on TV. There's all sorts of opportunities around. You just need to zone in. On the right one, and something that you can do—a service or a product that you can offer. Now, of course, being best depends on your ability to see what someone else is doing, and then figuring out a way to do it better, cheaper, faster, more profitably, more efficiently, or quite frankly, all of the above. So you just need to improve on something that's already there, and you need to. You know, there's the old saying: if you can build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Now let's look at some examples of people who've been able to do something either first or better than other people. And let's look at some examples from the online world first of all. And the first example is Mark Zuckerberg. Now, Mark Zuckerberg co-founded Facebook while he was still a student at Harvard University, and legend has it that he set up this as a way that guys could rate girls online. And the thing was loosely based on a printed publication that's used in some private schools in the U.S., where they have a photograph of the student. They list some details about them. They list hobbies and that sort of thing, and also contact details. And although it's known by various different names, lots of people refer to it as the Facebook because it's got pictures of people's faces in it. And so he started this. He put it up online. Harvard University's servers crashed because so many people were trying to get online and look at it. And he released it to the wider world, and the company is now worth nearly two hundred and forty-five billion dollars. So, there you go. You can see that Mark Zuckerberg was—he was first in some ways. He was first to put this online, but he also saw something that he'd come across in the past and was able to do it better and more efficiently. Now, our next entrepreneur is Ben Silberman. Ben Silberman co-founded Pinterest. And this grew out of a childhood love of collecting things. He used to collect all sorts of stuff when he was a boy, and he figured that if you could collect things online and put them into or collect things on your、uh, smartphone and post them on a website, then that would be something that you could share with other people without them having to actually physically turn up at your house and look at your collections. So that's how he came up with the idea for Pinterest, and they turned it into an app. And as they say, the rest is history. So you can see how he took a hobby and turned it into a business, and of course, a very successful business. 
Then there's Arianna Huffington. Now, Arianna Huffington launched the Huffington Post in 2005, and it was an overtly liberal and left-wing outlet and an alternative to news aggregators such as the Drudge Report, which tend to be fairly right-wing. And so she wanted to really set a balance. And it's become probably the world's most successful online newspaper. I don't know whether you can actually call it a paper because it is uh, online, but, but it is one of the most successful online newspapers. And it was the first online publication to win a Pulitzer Prize. And so it is now taken very, very seriously by the world in general. And of course, it started out as a blog and then moved on to becoming a much more serious publication. So again, you see, she saw a need, she saw a way to fill it and simply scaled things up. Now let's look at some offline examples, because the same principles from the offline world can also be applied to the online world as well. Now, our first offline entrepreneur is arguably one of the world's most famous and successful entrepreneurs, and that's Sir Richard Branson. And he started his first business selling records by mail order at cheaper prices than record stores. And he knew that teenagers, because the market was mainly aimed at teenagers, presented a ready market and they didn't have a lot of money. And then his business grew from there to actually recording his own records. I think um, Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells was the first one that was released on the Virgin label. And he's gone on now to uh, found goodness knows how many different businesses because he's been able to take the skills that he's acquired from running one business, applying it to the next. So you see, he saw a need, he saw a want, and he just simply came up with a way to fill it. And finally, of course, there's Thomas Edison. Now, Thomas Edison developed many devices that greatly influenced life around the world. And he held 1,093 US patents in his name, as well as many patents in the United Kingdom, France and Germany. And Thomas Edison really changed the world. You, know, you wouldn't be watching this video right now if it wasn't for Thomas Edison because he invented sound recording. He also set up one of the first commercial electricity generating companies in the world. He showed that it was possible to distribute electricity to households and to businesses. So really, by being able to harness electricity and show that there was a demand for it, he changed the world. But, of course, all this comes with a word of caution. Just because something can be made into a business doesn't mean that you should make it into a business. You should be aware of the laws that hold true over your location of your business, as there may be some lesser known rules that preclude your business opportunity. So just because you can buy, say, pharmaceuticals in one country over the counter that's only available on prescription in another country doesn't mean that you should set yourself up as the uh, pharmaceutical import export business because that might get you into a lot of trouble. You should also avoid starting businesses on things that you cannot see any possible growth in. So if you look at something and think, yeah, this might make a good business, but then when you start to work through your business plan, you can see that it's not going to go anywhere, then really you don't want to waste your time on it. Because a bad idea is a bad idea and it won't get you any customers no matter how long you wait. One thing that's essential if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to develop the right mindset to be an entrepreneur is you need to get rid of unrealistic expectations. And I'm going to cover that in this video. Because there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about starting a business on the internet. People think that it is a walk in the park when in fact it isn't and it can be very time consuming, and it can be very stressful. But let's just look at some of the myths and misconceptions that people have. Well, the first myth is that you can work anytime. You know, you can make X thousand dollars a day at home in your underwear. All you got to do is work a couple of hours whenever you feel like doing it. Well, unfortunately, 
work any time often means work all the time because you find that there's a lot of things to do in starting up an online business. And of course, in the early days when it's just you, well, you have to do it. And so you can find that all of your time gets taken up by your business you find that you end up burning the midnight oil every night because you simply have got to get these things done and there's nobody around to do it but you and another myth is that you can get rich quick all you've got to do is put up your website find a few products to sell and hey presto the money is going to roll in in tidal waves of cash and you all you've got to do is just figure out how you're going to spend it well the vast majority of internet entrepreneurs don't make a lot of money and the money that does come in tends to be in dribs and drabs especially to start off with you know, lots of internet entrepreneurs only have the internet as a part-time income. They still have a job to provide their main income. And it's often after being in business for several years that they're making enough money that they can actually quit their job and go on to internet marketing full-time. So it's get rich slow or not get rich at all rather than get rich quick. Another myth about the internet is that you don't need a business plan. Well, let me tell you, you need a business plan for every business and an online business is no exception. You need to have some idea as to uh, the amount of money that you're going to make. You need to have some idea as to the sort of cash flow that you're going to expect. You have to have uh, some goal in mind that you want your business to achieve. And it's no different for an online business than it is for an offline business. Another reason that a lot of people get into internet marketing or become an entrepreneur and run their own business is because there's no boss. You're not going to have a boss shouting at you. You're not going to have someone giving you unrealistic deadlines. You're not going to have to take the heat from somebody else. You're not going to be the designated can carrier if something goes wrong. But the flip side to that is, of course, when there's no boss, well, you're the boss. And let me tell you, you will never work for a harder taskmaster than yourself. You will be on your own case 24-7. Whereas, of course, when you have a boss, you uh, say goodbye to them at the end of the working day and go home. But when you're working for yourself, when you're the boss, you are on your own case all the time. Plus, of course, when you have a boss, you can pass all the decisions, the really hard decisions upstairs. And if something goes wrong, well, that's their problem, not yours. But of course, when you're the boss, you have to make all the decisions right or wrong. And that can weigh very heavily on your shoulders. There's nobody else to uh, pass that on to. You have to make all the decisions because, well, you're the boss. So not having a boss has its downside as well as its upside. Now, when it comes to being an online entrepreneur, most people have expectations that are unrealistic and cannot be achieved. So unless you're a magician, there really is no way for those things to come true. For instance, earning an unlimited income is simply way too out of this world. Even billionaires cannot dream of a paycheck this big. You know, even people like Bill Gates don't have an unlimited income. It just simply doesn't happen. So it's time to get real, folks. It's setting the bar too high when you start your internet business, when you decide to become an entrepreneur, only leads to disappointment and frustration. So do yourself a favor and do not fall into this trap. Your expectations for your business, for its profitability, for the amount of time that you're going to have to put into it should be grounded on reality. And quite frankly, being an entrepreneur online is not that different from being an entrepreneur offline. The same sort of decisions had to be made. It's just that you're trading in an online environment rather than a physical bricks and mortar environment. And when you start any business, offline or online, you have to bear several things in mind. First of all, 
it's going to take longer than you think. And second of all, it's going to cost more than you expect. I've heard it said that you should work out how long you think it's going to take and how much it's going to cost and then double it because that's going to be nearer the real result. I suppose it's human nature to uh, think that you can do something quicker and cheaper than it actually works out to be. And remember, to get to the top, well, you have to expect trials and even failure once in a while. It's all part of being an entrepreneur. One of the key things that you need to have when you're an entrepreneur is a thick skin. And I mean that metaphorically, not literally, you understand. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can develop that in this video. Now, one thing is you do need to know what people really think, even if it's hurtful. So in your business activities, you need to ask for feedback. You need to take it constructively, but don't take it personally. Because surrounding yourself with yes men or yes women won't do you any good. And sometimes you can get so close to what you're doing that you, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. So getting feedback, hearing things that perhaps you don't want to hear, hearing things that perhaps aren't very pleasant, all comes with the territory. So you don't take it personally. So you develop a thick skin so that you can take the blow, but it doesn't hurt as much. You also want to tune out unhelpful negative comments that you're going to get about your business because some people will want you to fail now i know that sounds an odd thing to say you know why would somebody want you to fail but there are several reasons why that might happen and sometimes it's because people are afraid of your success you know, your, your friends and family might think to themselves well if you become rich and successful, you'll be a different person. You won't want us anymore. You won't want to be around us anymore. You'll move away to some fancy neighborhood and we'll never see you very often. And so they're afraid that if you're successful, it's going to have a negative impact on them. Other people will see you as a threat. Other people who think that you're going after the same amount of business as them will see you as a threat and they will want you to fail because then your failure will in some way help them to succeed. That's how they'll look at it anyway. And of course, if you do fail, if you do something that doesn't work out, there's always going to be people there who've never progressed beyond the playground who are going to say, you know, you couldn't do it, na 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 na, that sort of thing. You know, some people act like school children even when they're grown up. And of course, these people are often very quick to come up with another comment, which is, well, why don't you just give up and get a job? And there are some times when you're an entrepreneur, when things are not going very well, when cash flow's tight, when having a regular income and a regular paycheck can look pretty appealing. And there are going to be people who don't understand, who are not entrepreneurial minded, who are going to sort of try and pressure you into doing that. Something else that comes with developing a thick skin is ignoring unsolicited advice from people who don't know what they're talking about. And this is something that you'll encounter quite a lot uh, as an entrepreneur. You're going to find people who think they know what they're talking about and who don't, who don't know anything about your business, who don't know anything about being an entrepreneur or running a business or anything like that, but they are not going to uh, hold them back from offering their advice. In the UK, there's a comedian called Harry Enfield. And when he was doing his TV show back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, he had a character whose catchphrase was, you don't want to do it like that. And he used to say in a very sort of nasally, annoying, nasally sort of voice, you know, you don't want to do it like that. And... 
He would offer this advice to people and, of course, it would always end in disaster. And I'm sure that the character was based on someone that Harry Enfield knew. And let's face it, we all know people like that. We all know people who are going to sort of look at what you're doing and say, oh, you don't want to do it like that, and then offer some advice uh, based on what they think they know or based on what they think you ought to be doing when they really don't know anything about your business. So if you know what you're doing, you should be able to spot this sort of behavior a mile off. And if you think there's some credence to what they're saying, then by all means, check it out. But don't waste too much time on it, though. And when you're starting out in your business, when you're starting out being an entrepreneur, you need to have the right mindset to succeed. So you must avoid hearing derogative comments. Now, how can you do this? Well, the best way is simply not to talk about your online business during its early stages because there will be setbacks. There will be things that don't work out. You'll be feeling your way in the dark in lots of ways. And of course, there are going to be people who are going to uh, be enjoying the fact that things are not going exactly the way that you planned it. And there are going to be others who are going to be saying, yeah, you don't want to do it like that. So unless the person is also into online business or has some knowledge about the niche that you're taking, then there's no need to tell them, you know, wait until you succeed and have them witness it and they'll witness your success and they won't witness your failures and that'll keep them on the right side. However, if an expert gives you some free advice, then by all means, take it. People who have been there and done that will sometimes take it upon themselves to help others who are up and coming. And frankly, this advice is often worth its weight in gold. So you need to learn to tell the difference. And it's actually not all that difficult because good advice is usually framed positively and is backed up with examples and case studies, often from first-hand experience. Whereas know-it-all advice is usually negative in nature. You know, it's the you don't want to do it like that sort of advice. And you have to bear in mind that you won't be successful all the time. There will be setbacks. It's inevitable. And you will fail at some things. But what you need to do is to develop that thick skin, learn from the experience, and move on. And don't let other people's negativity put you off of pursuing your ambitions. In this video, I want to share some words of inspiration from entrepreneurs and successful business people who've made it. And the first one is from Herbert Simon, who was an American political scientist. And he said, one finds limits by pushing them. And that is indeed very true. Seth Godin, the motivational speaker, has got lots of inspiring quotations out there. I've picked a couple that are particularly relevant. Uh, the first one is, people rarely buy what they need, they buy what they want. And change is not a threat, it's an opportunity. Survival is not the goal, transformative success is. Richard Branson, probably one of the world's best-known entrepreneurs, says, a business has to be involving, it has to be fun, and it has to exercise your creative instincts. He also says, business opportunities are like buses, there's always another one coming. Henry Ford, the industrialist, said, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. The fashion designer Coco Chanel said, Success is often achieved by those who don't know that failure is inevitable. Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple Computing, said, 
Sometimes, when you innovate, you make mistakes. It's best to admit them quickly and get on with improving your other innovations. And a particularly poignant quote, bearing in mind that he died relatively young, is: "Your time is precious, so don't waste it living someone else's life." The actress and comedian Lily Tomlin said, "The problem with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat." Howard Aiken, the American physicist and computer pioneer, said, "Don't worry about people stealing your ideas. If your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram them down people's throats." Former Microsoft president Bill Gates said, "Your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning." TV host and entrepreneur Oprah Winfrey said, "Luck is preparation meeting opportunity." And Nolan Bushnell, one of the pioneers of computing, said, "The critical ingredient is getting off your butt and doing something. It's as simple as that. A lot of people have ideas, but there are a few who decide to do something about them now, not tomorrow, not next week, but today. The true entrepreneur is a doer, not a dreamer." And a few other short quotes here. Howard Janine, who was president of the ITT Corporation, says. In the business world, everyone is paid in two coins: cash and experience. Take the experience first; the cash will come later. Thomas Alva Edison,、uh, the prolific inventor and entrepreneur, said, "Genius is one percent inspiration and ninety-nine percent perspiration." And of course, we couldn't have a list of quotations without including one from Ben Franklin, probably from Poor Richard's Almanac. And he said, "People are best convinced by things they themselves discover." And finally, a quote from the galaxy's favorite philosopher Yoda: "Do, or do not. There is no try." In this video, we're going to talk about working smart rather than working hard, and there is a big difference. Now, let's look at some examples from the real world. Do you not think that cooks and dishwashers are working hard? What about construction workers, bulldozer operators, and delivery boys? Now, the work that they do is physical and can be really tiring. But ask yourself, how many of them actually live a luxurious life in return for their hard work? Well, yes, they manage to make ends meet and they're paying their bills, but. How do they compare with executives, managers, and CEOs? Now, this brings you to these next classes of workers, and when you look at them, you can't help but think that the big guns of international conglomerates and big companies are living a life of ease, right? After all, they seem to have everything from all the latest gadgets. They have the most luxurious car models. They take exotic holidays and all that sort of thing. So why is there such a huge gap in the financial standing between these two groups of people? Well, the answer is how they work, and this spells the difference between working hard and working smart. Now, going back to the construction workers, bus drivers, delivery boys, fry cooks, etc. Now, they are simply doing a preset series of tasks. They're not really making decisions; they are simply working hard. After all, no matter what the weather is or whether the economy goes up or down, the procedure of mopping or cooking or digging or delivering will change very little. And they're physically tiring jobs that require little decision making or smart thinking. On the other hand, CEOs, managers, and executives. Well, they're always making complex decisions. They're always doing deals. They're always finding new ideas for profit, and so on. So, simply put, their work involves working smart, not working hard. And if you're an entrepreneur, especially an internet entrepreneur, this is the most ideal way of working. In fact, it should be the only way that you should do things. Working hard online will not yield you cash or income, but working smart will. For example, 
it doesn't matter how many long hours you stay on your computer working hard to put up your site, to add the contents, or to do any other task. Even if you tie yourself down doing this, you'll not earn cash. Instead, what you have to do is you have to do things in a smart way, and this is the only way that your business is going to boom. Now, to better illustrate how working hard will not yield cash unless you do it a smart way, you should learn more about the misconceptions in the relationship between work and pay. Pay is not the result of work. Now, I know that sounds an odd thing to say, but it's true. And if you're like most people and you come from a fairly ordinary background, you've probably had this stuff dinned into you from a very early age by parents, teachers and other people who mean well. They tell you, go to school, work hard, get qualifications, go to college, get better qualifications, get a job, get a better job, work hard, get a raise, work hard, get a promotion, do plenty of overtime, you know, yada, yada, yada. Now, Following this kind of plan will yield income, and if you're lucky, the income may be good as well. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to go to school or college, but once you enter the world of work and you get yourself a wage slave job for an employer, you have to ask yourself, were you ever the one who made the decisions? Well, if you have a job, you have to make some decisions. But the ones who make the real decisions, the decisions that really matter, they're the bosses, the managers and the owners. All you're doing is working hard and you're working hard doing things that other people have set out for you to do. And the ones doing the smart jobs are the higher ups and they hired you so that they can focus on making decisions and finding profitable deals while leaving the hard stuff to you. So I'll say it again. Pay is not the result of work. Now, as an entrepreneur, you are your own boss. So this time around, you're the one that will be making the important decisions and actions. You're the one who's going to look for the clients. You're going to deal with them. You're going to win their favor and grab profit opportunities. And in the same way that bosses, managers and executives in the real world don't want to waste their time doing the menial jobs, this is also going to be true for you. If you focus on menial works, you're going to lose time on the most important things. So in this sense, working is a hindrance to being successful. And the work that I'm referring to refers to menial tasks. Now, I'm not saying that any business will be successful without those menial tasks being done. And if those tasks don't get done, then the business will surely crumble and fail. So yes, the menial tasks need to be done, but not by you. So to put it another way, you need to work on your business rather than in your business for it to be successful. And that has little to do with the amount of time and effort that you put in. So Don't sweat the small stuff. Concentrate on the big picture and your business will be successful. When you're an entrepreneur and you're starting your own business, you'll quickly find that you can't do everything. Because you see, there are only 24 hours in a day. And when you run your own business, you'll find that Even those 24 hours a day don't seem to be enough to get done everything that needs to be done. But the problem is, of course, you can't do more than one thing at a time. And despite what people say, multitasking isn't very efficient because you do need to concentrate on one thing at a time. So the answer to this is to delegate or outsource things that other people can do on your behalf. And you can outsource them to full or part-time employees. You can outsource them to freelancers. And you can outsource them to automated processes that simply take the task in hand and do it for you automatically. And you should delegate as much as you can as much as you're comfortable with, and as much as you can afford. Now, obviously, when you're just starting out in business and money is tight, you'll probably find that you have to do just about everything yourself. But as soon as you're starting to make a profit, you should reinvest that back in your business 
by hiring someone to carry out some of the uh, tasks that you don't really need to do. And that will free you up to concentrate on the big picture. And basically, anything that doesn't generate a direct income should be delegated as soon as it's possible to do so. I've put together this mind map to give you an idea of the sort of tasks that you should consider delegating or outsourcing. And I suppose the first thing that you'll want to outsource is web hosting. You'll want to outsource the hosting of your website to another professional web hosting company. And there are lots of them out there and prices vary depending on what you want. But usually shared hosting is uh, the best way of going when you're just starting out because the prices tend to be quite lower. And oftentimes you'll find that the web hosting company is actually outsourcing the actual hosting, the actual machines to another company as well. So this goes on in business all the time. Something else you'll want to outsource right away is web design and graphics. Unless you are uh, a website designer, unless you've had some sort of training in graphic design, it's a good idea to outsource this because if your website looks amateurish, then that's going to reflect badly on your business. So hiring a web designer, hiring a professional graphics artist to create the artwork for your website is money well spent. You can also right away start outsourcing things to automated programs. And by that, I mean things like autoresponders so that you can send out emails automatically. You can respond to people when they send you an inquiry email. You can send them out just a courtesy response. You can also start to build your mailing list and send things out to people who sign up um, on your squeeze page or uh, uh, on your website so that you can send them an email right away. You don't have to respond to it personally. It's all taken care of by the autoresponder company. Auto publishers, if you have a blog, you can write your blog articles ahead of time and then schedule them to be published at a convenient later date so that you don't have to be constantly thinking, oh, isn't it time to update my blog now? You can simply do it as and when you have the time available and then it can be published right away. And the other thing that you can automate is credit card processing so that when people come to your site and they want to buy a product or they want to buy a service from you, uh, they can enter their credit card details and then after it's gone through, be directed to either a thank you page or a download page. And you can use this either as a standalone or as part of a shopping cart program. Some things, like for example auto publishers, that's not going to cost you anything if you've got a WordPress blog because WordPress now includes the capability to uh, publish at a later date. So you can set that up right away for nothing. Autoresponder companies vary in how much they charge, but usually that's based upon how many subscribers you have. So when you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of subscribers, it doesn't cost a great deal. Uh, credit card processing companies, some have a signing up fee, others don't, and then they charge you so much per transaction. So if you don't have any transactions going through, it doesn't uh, cost you anything. So again, your outlay isn't a great deal up front because obviously when you're just starting out, quite often cash flow can be a bit tight. As soon as you can afford it, it's a good idea to outsource some admin tasks. And you can outsource things to an online secretary or a virtual assistant. Uh, if financial staff, you'll probably want to outsource to your accountant and he or she will probably also outsource things to a bookkeeper or delegate things to a bookkeeper and as financial software as well. Your virtual assistant can do all sorts of things for you and you can hire him or her by the day, by the hour, or however often it's, you know, however it's the most convenient for you. And you can have them do things like correspondence, setting up your social media. If you find that you're spending a lot of time updating Twitter or Facebook, then you might want to hire someone to do that for you, that sort of thing. 
unless you're actually in the marketing business, it's a good idea to outsource your marketing to um, a marketing consultancy or a marketing agency because they will have the skills to make sure that your business is marketed in the best possible way. And they'll do things like writing blog content and articles which can attract visitors to your website and maximize your SEO or search engine optimization. And then also handle things like paid advertising, things like Google AdWords and Facebook ads are the most popular uh, online advertising. But of course, obviously, if you're in the marketing business, then you wouldn't want to outsource this. But if uh, you're running any other type of online business, then it's a good idea to have a marketing person on your side as soon as you can afford it. Something else to outsource is product development. And that means things like coding or writing so that you don't have to spend the time working on the ebook. You don't have to spend the time coding the app or even you don't know, have to take the time making the video. If you're making a video product, you can outsource that to a video production company. And again, what you can do is simply brief them and tell them what you want. And because they're a professional outfit, you're a professional writer, professional coder, professional video producer, they'll know what you want and they'll be able to get on with it while you concentrate on building your business in other areas. Early on, you'll probably want to use private label right material or PLR material in addition or instead of developing your own product. And you can use these as a source of additional income on top of your product that you sell. You can use them to attract new customers. So, for example, you could give away a PLR ebook to people who sign up for your mailing list. And you can use it to keep old customers around because you can add it to the things that you sell. Uh, and you can create these things very quickly. You can buy them, relabel them, send them out, and always have a new product even while your next real product is still in development. If you're looking to hire temporary or freelance staff, then a good site to look on is Upwork, which you can find here at upwork.com. And you can find freelancers, it says, to tackle any job, any size, any time. And what happens is people will then bid to work on your project. For shorter jobs, small jobs that you need doing, then you can always look on Fiverr, which is Fiverr with two R's dot com. And here people offer all sorts of services for five dollars or multiples of five dollars and it can be very cost effective if you're looking for anything to do with internet marketing or copywriting or coding or that sort of thing then a good place to look is the warriors for hire section of the warrior forum which you can find here at warriorforum.com forward slash warriors hyphen higher and you can see they've got all sorts of different people here at the time I'm making this video you've got copywriters and uh, Facebook ad management and that sort of thing and it's all generally very reasonably priced uh, for autoresponders and email marketing there are a couple of good sites uh, the first one is Aweber which you can find here at aweber.com and you can use an autoresponder to send out mailings on a regular basis, which saves you the trouble of having to do it yourself. And at the time that I'm making this video, Aweber is offering a 30-day free trial. Another good autoresponder service is MailChimp, which you can find here at MailChimp.com. And it works in a similar way to Aweber. For credit card processing, payment processing, probably the most popular processor out there is PayPal, which you can find here at paypal.com. And PayPal will handle all the payments uh, from credit cards and debit cards. Now, PayPal doesn't operate in every country throughout the world. So you might find that you need another credit card processor to uh, access customers in countries where PayPal doesn't operate. And a good one that I've used in the past is to check out, which you can find here at to checkout.com. 
and they also accept payments via PayPal as well as credit card and debit card. And there are, of course, alternatives to all these available. If you do a search in Google or any internet search engine, you should find some that perhaps uh, are suited more to where you happen to be in the world. In this video, I want to talk about how you can learn from experts when you're an entrepreneur. Now, the thing is, when you're an entrepreneur, you never stop learning. In fact, in life, you never really stop learning, even if you may have left school or college. And no matter how good you get at your business, you can always learn from others. And a good way to do this, and a good way to do this for free, is to simply observe what's going on. You know, visit competitors' websites. Take a look at their business model and then reverse engineer it so that you can emulate their success. Or if one of your competitors is a quoted company, well, buy shares or buy stock in that company because they'll have to send you their annual report and you can go through it and see exactly what they're doing and you can learn from that. Another good source of knowledge is attending seminars and webinars. You'll often find in any uh, type of business that there are seminars and webinars being put on and experts will give you the benefit of their knowledge. Another good thing about attending seminars is you'll often be able to meet other people who are in the same line of work and you'll be able to network with them and learn from them as well. Which brings me to the next point, which is networking. And a good way to network is to join a professional organization or a chamber of commerce, because then that puts you in touch with other people who are in a similar line of work. And also, particularly if you join a chamber of commerce, you'll be in touch with people who are in different niches, different lines of work. Because sometimes you can learn things from similar businesses and similar niches that can be applied to your own. So not from direct competitors, but from people who are doing something similar to you. Uh, then you can apply that to your own business and your own line of work. Another way to increase your knowledge is to purchase reports and ebooks, because quite often when someone has become an expert at something, they will immediately publish a report, they will publish an ebook, which will explain how they've become successful, and then you can emulate their success. Also, you can spend time on forums, forums that are related to your niche. And to find them, simply do a search in Google for whatever your business or niche is, followed by forum, and you'll find lots. And there are forums on practically every type of business and every type of niche out there. And you can get lots of good ideas, share good ideas from other people who are involved in that same line of business. A good forum site for anything to do with internet marketing is the Warrior Forum, which you can find here at warriorforum.com. And it does help you get in touch with other internet marketers and you can bounce ideas off of them and find out what's going on. And there are lots of useful information here on the Warrior Forum to do with all things IM. Another site for business in general is LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is a bit more than just a forum. It's a sort of a social network for businesses, but it can help you get in touch with other people in your niche, other people in your line of business, and you can often find people to collaborate with on LinkedIn. Something else that you can do is to hire a coach. And what most people do when they hire a coach is they hire someone to help them overcome a specific problem or a specific difficulty. And when you hire a coach, this tends to be a short-term proposition, just so you can get some extra help. And you can hire a different coach as and when needed. So if you have one problem, then you can hire a coach to help you through that. And then when you take your business to the next level, you can hire another coach to help you deal with the issues that you're going to face there. And what you're doing when you hire a coach is you're paying them for their advice and for their expertise.
Beyond coaching, you can also find a mentor. Now, mentoring is a long-term proposition, and mentors are not always paid. Sometimes they're just experienced people who want to pass on their knowledge, and your mentor can learn from you too. So it could be a win-win situation for you both. And you have to bear in mind several things. First of all, experts will be more than willing to mentor an up-and-coming newbie, but on the other hand, they won't waste their time on someone without potential. So, if you want their advice, you have to demonstrate that you have the proper mindset and that you're coming into the field with a plan. So, you already have to have some idea as to what you're talking about. You have to have some idea as to where you want your business to go, and then your mentor. Will help you take that to the next level. Now there are all sorts of places that you can find mentors. Professional organisations can help put you in touch with a mentor. Banks, in some places, have mentors to help their small business clients and that sort of thing. The title of this video is "Invest in Yourself," and this doesn't just mean. Investing in terms of finance, it also means investing in terms of time and investing in terms of education. In the UK, in the 1990s, the Labour Party ran an election campaign, and their slogan was "Education, Education, Education." Although they were trying to win votes by encouraging parents of school children to vote for them for a better education for their kids, having a better education for yourself is one of the best things that you can do for yourself. One of the best things that you can do for your business, because investing in yourself is very important since you form the core of your business. So, in a sense, your knowledge and abilities are the backbone of the company. So, the more education you have about the way that your business works and about the way that business works in general, the better you're going to be as a person. The better your business is going to be, and of course, the more profitable it's likely to be. Now, of course. Time is a limited thing, so you do have to work this into your day. But there are some ways that you can do it, and probably the easiest way is to study after work. Now, with the fast-paced nature of technology, you really do need to make an effort to stay at the top, and you can do this by keeping yourself up to date and in touch with the latest trends on the internet and the world around you. So what you can do is create a custom RSS feed page of news that's related to your industry or niche, and you can read that in the evenings after you've finished work. You can subscribe to industry-related magazines, to industry-related newsletters, and to blogs. And again, you can read them in your free time, and you can network and you can talk to other people in your niche. You can also use your idle time. Now, time is gold when you run a business, and you'll soon discover that twenty-four hours in a day really isn't long enough. So you should avoid wasting precious time by putting it to good use. And your daily commute may be used to come up with ideas for your business. And you can, as I was saying in the last point, study during your idle time. If you commute by train, if you take the train or the subway, like in this picture here, then you can use that time to read or to study. If you、uh, take public transport、uh, of any kind, if you take the bus, for example, to your office, then you can also use that time. If you drive your car, obviously you need to concentrate on the road. So therefore. Uh, studying on your commute probably isn't a good idea, but other times, if you just go for a walk, you can use that to、uh, tune your mind into things that might be able to、uh, improve your business. And this is another thing: tuning in your mind. You need to improve your personal virtues. 
because your mindset has a huge impact on the success of your business. Now, positive thinking may not guarantee success, but negative thinking does have a tendency towards self-fulfillment. So, having the right mindset means having the willingness to work hard until your goals are achieved. And this line of thinking is grounded in reality and it avoids irrational thinking. So, in other words, effort is needed for success. And you need to train your brain to think that. And you also need to invest in your physical appearance. Most online entrepreneurs will try to connect with their audience as part of their business plan. And this is usually done through videos posted on websites or newsletters. And in this context, investing in yourself means making yourself look presentable to your audience. So with this in mind, make a point to observe proper grooming before recording that video. And also, if you're networking with people in real life, there's the old saying, never judge a book by its cover, but unfortunately people do. So if you look scruffy, if you're down at heel, if you look like you're struggling, if you're hard up, then people will think, well, gosh, their business isn't doing very well because look how scruffy they're dressed, look how unkempt they look. So when you make a point of investing in your physical appearance, when you wear nice clothes, when you get your hair done, then that, of course, creates a good impression for people that you meet. Something else that you need to do is to get outside of your comfort zone. Now, sticking inside your personal comfort zone, well, it's part of human nature and it keeps you feeling safe and secure. However, this often prevents you from expanding your horizon and learning new things and that's bad for business. New ideas come up almost every day and it would be a shame to pass on them. So investing in yourself means getting out of your comfort zone and taking risks every once in a while. And trying new things can lead to better and more efficient ways of conducting business. But the thing is, you have to try them for yourself. So being receptive to new ideas and taking risks is the key to both success and to life. There's an old saying which says, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I'm going to show you how to overcome that in this video. First, though, you must envision a concept in which you're going to base your business plan. So here is a six-step method for coming up with a business concept. Now, step one is to evaluate things that you like. And in real life, those who usually succeed are the ones who love what they do. And naturally, if you love your work, giving it your best will not require a lot of effort. It's going to come out naturally and you're not going to feel stressed. In fact, you might just want to keep on going and forget what the time is. So you want to search for niches that you love. Now, this could be music, pet care, gadgetry, tourism or anything other, any other thing, something you've got a hobby that you'd like to base a business around, something that you're interested in, something that you're passionate about. And step two is you want to see if those likes can be profitable. So after making a list of the things that interest you personally, you want to evaluate each of them. And you want to think about how you can convert them into a business idea. Now, this could be a website or a blog. It could be an info product, you know, an ebook, a report, a video, an audio product, that sort of thing. It could be an app, uh, a smartphone app or a computer web app, that sort of thing. Or it could be a service that you could offer. You know, the list just goes on and on and on. But any way that you can see where that interest might be turned into a profitable idea. You know, really give it some deep thought. Step three, you want to check to see if there is a demand for this. So the next test that your chosen niche must pass is whether there is a demand for it or not. Of course, a highly demanded product or service will be the one that's most likely to earn a profit. 
Now, to help you assess your competition, there are some online tools that can help. And the first one is the Google AdWords Keyword Planner. And this is a free tool, but you do have to have a Google account to use it. If you've got a Gmail account or something like that, then you'll automatically be signed up. If you haven't, then you can sign up online at Google and it's fairly straightforward. This is quite a complicated and long URL, so if you just go to Google and do a search for Google AdWords Keyword Planner, then you'll be directed to the sign-in page. And once you've signed in, you'll be directed to this page and you can find new keywords and get search volume data. And it's the search volume data that you're going to be interested in at this stage. Because what this will tell you is, first of all, how many other sites are indexed for that particular keyword. So you have an idea as to how competitive it is. You'll also get to see how many people are searching for that particular keyword, either all around the world or in a particular country. So you can use it to see exactly how popular it is, and uh, it can give you a lot of good ideas. If you want some more in-depth analysis, then a good tool to get is Market Samurai, which you can find here at marketsamurai.com. There is a free trial offer on this. Otherwise, it is uh, fairly limited. The free version is actually fairly limited, but the full version, which, as I say, you can get the um, a free trial offer on, uh, does tell you a lot of information, particularly to do with how competitive a particular keyword is and how much competition a particular website has. Also, you can use SpyFu, which is spyfu.com. And what you do with this is do a search in Google or another search engine for your particular search term, your particular interest. Find the top rated site. Enter its URL here. And it will give you all sorts of information about the most profitable keywords and ads that they're using. And then what you can do is go back into the Google Keyword Planner or Market Samurai and enter those search terms in. And you can get a much better picture as to how competitive that particular search term is. So you can get a lot of information that way. OK, that takes us on to step four, which is to check for possible competitors. Now, if keywords are always hitting high search rates, it's likely that other internet marketers already know about it too. And so the possibility for competition is high. So before plunging in excitedly, check first if the business plan that you're planning to implement has many competitors. The more competitors there are, the more difficult it's going to be for you to succeed. And you can use uh, some of the tools that we looked at in the last point there to check to see how many competitors you have, uh, especially Market Samurai, which can give you a good idea as to uh, how competitive a particular keyword is. OK, step five, you want to plan how you can be unique. Now, while having only a handful of competitors is ideal, it doesn't mean that having a lot of competitors will make success impossible. In fact, you can thrive despite the competition. Now, how can you do this? Well, you need to think of ways in which you can be unique. Because even if you offer the same thing, uniqueness will make you stand out. It takes me on to step six, which is to check what competitors do and don't offer. Those competitors will have a website which anyone can view. So, just like a prospective customer, Go ahead and browse through their pages and their offerings and see what they do and do not have. And from this, you can create your own uniqueness. Now, maybe your competitors does not offer this and that, and you know, perhaps they don't have an effective this and that. You just have to look and see what they do and don't offer. And from those, you'll learn a lot of things. And then once you've done all that, you want to write it down. Write it down so you can refer to it. 
if possible, you actually want to physically get a pen or a pencil and some paper and write it down yourself because that makes it stick in your mind more effectively than simply typing it out on your computer. But if you do decide that you want to type it out on your computer, fine, go ahead and do that. But print it out so you can stick it up on the wall next to your computer monitor so that you know exactly what it is that you need to do so that you have a map right there for you to follow. And once you've done that, then you can start to drill down to look at the profitability uh, to do all the income forecasts etc and there are lots of business plan templates that you can find online that will help you do that and once you've done that your business stands a much better chance of being successful than if you just simply wing it and I wish you every success this is a time to apply the power of belief the time to make the decision. It takes courage. It takes confidence. That's when you use your powerful mindset to get back up when nobody believes in you. It's time to chase your dream, vision, plan, and action. VPA. VPA will guide you step by step to chase your dreams and goals. VPA works for everyone. It caters to all, including students, graduates, working professionals, senior executives, and mainly entrepreneurs. To learn more, visit our website. I am Dr. Sean Kumar. This is my mastermind.